you want to grow your business? Are, are we trying to get more people to know, like, and trust you? That's a certain type of content. Are we trying to target certain people to get a client quickly? That's a different type of content. Like, what is the goal of the content? If you don't know before you do anything with the video what the goal is, you're not going to get there. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Escape the Cage Marketing Podcast. And I am really happy to bring on my guest today. This is Zach Mitchum. And, and just to give you a brief overview of what Zach has done, I've been following Zach since I got really serious about video marketing, probably about a year ago with TikTok. And um, I have followed his growth, uh, the expansion of his business. And so vi YouTube video marketer, Zach Mitchum, welcome to the show today. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be on today. So Zach, I always start off with the same question with everyone because I think it's the most powerful. And tell us about your story and your background and how this all happened for you. Yeah, so this was, I, I tell use this phrase a lot, but accidentally on purpose. Um, I was originally going to school to become a PA, a physician assistant, and happened upon a YouTuber that was doing some cool things. Um, he was able to quit his, you know, six figure a year job where he was traveling a lot to do YouTube. It's like, this is awesome. Can you teach me? And um, <laughs> interacted with him and some other YouTubers. Um, but I didn't end up getting into PA school and, at, you know, pandemic hit, you know, a lot of things. I was already very interested in video since I was young, but it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to dive into this eight months in my channel, brand new channel made $20,000. I'm like, okay, there's something to this. Um, started talking with other companies and started offering consulting services. Um, and actually last year, Evan Carmichael, for those of you who know him, invested in my business and, um, business has just skyrocketed. It's been insane the like I, I worked up to before working with him to like fortune 500 companies working on youtube things like that so i was i was working with some pretty big people but the level of client we're working with now is just blows anything that i was doing out of the water and it's it's been amazing yeah it's been so exciting to watch your growth and now when i first mentioned these numbers and what i'm about to say some people might think of this as a slight but i just I don't want you to take it that way because no. it's it's going to prove a larger point. So I remember a long time ago, I saw one of your videos and you said, my goal is to get to 100,000 followers in like 90 days. Yeah. And so I'm just going to tell your numbers and how, because you and I, I think, believe the same thing, which is numbers don't tell the story of how successful a business you have. But 100%. your goal was to get 100,000 followers in 90 yep. days. Um, well over a year later, you're at 35,000 followers on TikTok. You've got yeah. an audience of 2.4,000 uh, 2 subscribers on YouTube, mm -hmm. less than 3,500 or about 3,600 on Instagram, but you run a thriving business. Tell yeah. people about the, the biggest lesson that what that original goal was and, yeah. and how it's translated now and how you think about it differently. Yeah. So, I mean, and I've learned a lot more since partnering up with Evan, but it's like it there's running a business and having clients and revenue, and then there's vanity metrics and the two can cross paths, but they're, they're very different. And so, uh, that original goal of a hundred thousand, I had gone from zero to 30,000 in 90 days. I'm like, okay, cool. Second 90 days, we're going to get to a hundred, but I was so burnt out because of how I was doing content that I, I literally stopped really close after that. And I was just like, I, I can't sustain this. My business is suffering because I'm making so much content. Like it was, it was taking away from the things that mattered most. And my wife does operations. She does really well well. And so I was stay at home parent, still running a business. Like I wanted to overtake her income so that she can kind of pull back. And, uh, that wasn't anywhere close at that point. Uh, now we're getting much closer to that. But what I learned was that, you know, Evan's advice to me, he's like, for you, the content is not what drives the business. There are ways that we do that with our clients, but right now you need clients. And so let's focus on that. And so create the content with the goal of getting the client not creating content that you hope will get the client later. And what I mean by that is shows like this, like if you were to invite someone on and say, Hey, I'm going to spend an hour with you promoting you and you're a good potential client for me. Worst case scenario, we just have a good relationship. Best case scenario, you start working with me. You refer someone to me. My business grows in some way and there's, it's just goodwill. Like I'm just helping you regardless of if you ever work with me or not. And that will grow your business. That video is probably not getting a ton of views because you're probably bringing on something that's like, Eh, probably not the best guest in the world, but it's a good relationship. And so most people don't focus on that type of content. We want to do the, like the thought leadership type content is what I call it, where it's like, here are my ideas. Here are the things that I think you should be doing differently. Here are 
the things that you can do to grow what you're doing. And that does like five, 10 years from now, like you'll be known for that. And that's great. But if your business dies before you get there, you're never going to get there. And so it's really understanding what the purpose and the goal of the content is. So getting to 100,000 subscribers on TikTok, that might have done something for me. But what did more for me was very, very targeted relationships that I got in that 30,000 subscribers, where I did get a couple of five figure contracts from TikTok. I did get a couple of brands to reach out to me that sent me multiple thousands of dollars worth of product that I could review. And they were on my dream list of clients to, or uh, brands to work with. So there was some help there, but it was like there were five individual accounts out of 30,000 that actually did anything. And if I just be more targeted in what I'm doing and how I'm creating content, I can have a six or seven figure business and not have a large audience. And I think that that's so important because, um, you know, Seth Godin believes in a thousand raving fans, not a hundred thousand followers. And, and obviously yeah. it sounds like that's exactly what, you, what you're doing, uh, as well. So, yeah. um, Talk about the evolution then over maybe the last year or so. I mean, you kind of touched on a little bit, but talk about the evolution of how much content you create, how you create content, the kind of subject matters that you you now cover as opposed to what you were doing in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So a year ago, I was creating a lot of content on teaching people how to create better content on YouTube and TikTok and like just social media generally, how to brand different things like that. And I went through some iterations where I was focusing more on TikTok because I was growing fast. I was learning a lot. I had friends that they have millions or hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok. So I was learning a lot. I was like, mostly sharing what I was learning. And then I transitioned to going back to more YouTube because that is my wheelhouse. That's what I've been doing for the past four years. But recently, again, you know, what I've realized is that the business is going to do so much revenue that I don't need for me to create content that pays me or gets clients that way. I can use it that way. And I have everything set up in a way that I could do that if I wanted to. But right now I'm actually fac focusing more on some passion projects when I'm creating my content because I'm a creator at heart. I want to get some of these things out. There's some missions that I would love to serve, you know, personally, but they don't, I'm probably not gonna get paid a whole lot from them. That's okay. But as a creator at heart, I have to do that. I stopped creating content for about six weeks to really build up clients because I went from quite a few clients down to zero. Like we had some issues and I literally went to zero in the business and then stopped making content. And we went to on track for 100K for the year. And then three weeks after that, on track for 200K. Like it, it's just been growing super, super fast. But I had to stop creating content for that time period. And a lot of business owners are probably like, oh, that's fine. I don't need to create content. Like, I do it because it grows my business and it's great, but I don't, I don't feel the need to. And for me, I was like itching that entire six weeks. I might have to create a video. I had like, that's something I have to do and probably will always do whether it pays me or not. And so what I've learned is what is the goal of the content? If it's to serve a passion project, if it's to fulfill you creatively, great. Just know that's probably not going to get a lot of views. It's not going to grow your business. It's going to do what it's meant to do, which is fill that. If you want to grow your business, are, are we trying to get more people to know, like, and trust you? That's a certain type of content. Are we trying to target certain people to get a client quickly? That's a different type of content. Like, what is the goal of the content? If you don't know before you do anything with the video what the goal is, you're not going to get there. I had a client I worked with that had been doing content for 10 years and phenomenal content, like paid a lot of money in production to create these videos. And that a decade is when things started really to pay off. And even then, the goals that they had couldn't be realized because they had spent a decade doing not quite the right thing. And if they just had have said, okay, here's my goal for this, they could have accomplished that in two years instead of 12. Um, so it's, it's, what's the goal? What do you want this content to do and make sure it's serving that purpose? And I think that's a great lesson in that everything you need to do, you need to figure out what the intention for it is rather than just doing it and not having any master plan. I'm, I'm sure that's one of the lessons that you've learned through this whole process as well. Yeah, 100%. So what is the, what's the difference between content that educates versus content that actually gets clients? So kind of, yeah. kind of talk about the differences between those two. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, I mean, we have a lot of frameworks, but one of the frameworks that we use frequently, we call the three shows. So you have the first show is the biz dev show. Second show is show the process. And the third show is thought leadership. So if we start at the bottom, which is the hardest content, which is the one that takes the longest to get to, that's where most people start. That is, here's my big ideas. Here's what I think you should do. Here are like, I'm educating you on my stuff. And that's thought leadership, which may get you clients. It's going to show people, you know, what you're talking about. So that could potentially get there. But there's two really big problems with that type of content. One, 
even if you teach me these concepts, you teach me all these things. I don't know what you do as a service. I don't know what you offer. Like you, you're not, you're not pitching me, which is good because we don't want to do that in content, but I also don't know what you offer. And so I, even if I needed to hire you, I don't know how, I don't know if I can. The other thing is the person you're talking to is some viewer. You don't know who they are. You don't know where they are. You don't know if they can afford your service. If they're even a target client, like you, you don't know because you're just putting it out there. That will grow your business over time. It really will, but it's, it, it's long-term. This is your investment type content. You know, it's going to compound over five, 10 years. Show the process. That's show number two. This is where it's like, so for me, and we keep our client list private, so I would never do this with a client, but it's like, show what the thing you want to get paid for. And so if I do YouTube strategy consulting, maybe I say, hey, you know, I know you have a YouTube channel. Let's bring you on my show for free. I'm not going to charge you for the session. Normally I charge X, whatever, but we're just going to make a video. And I'm going to show me in the process of coaching someone like I would normally on my calls, give them a free session, create content that shows what I offer. Now people know what I offer. They know what my service is. You know, I say, Hey, this, maybe the person's in one of your, um, courses, or maybe they're in one of your groups or something that you're like, Hey, this is this person from X group. You know, I do a lot of YouTube strategy consulting, whatever you do. And today we're just going to do a breakdown of their business, their channel, their whatever. And people are like, Oh, so he does this service. I can hire them. And then they get to see how good you are at the thing that you do. And it's like, oh man, I've got to hire this person. How do I do it? You put it in the description links, whatever that, like now people know. And that's faster at getting business, still slower than the first type of show that we're going to talk about here in a second. But it doesn't also compound as much as the thought leadership. So it's kind of a you know compromise between the two. Biz dev is, okay, who is a good potential client for me? Who's a good potential referral partner? Who's like, if this video gets zero views, the hour that I spend recording this with a person, the relationship is going to build my business. It's going to make me money. It's going to do something that way. And I really don't care. I can get no views ever. Like it could not get posted, still post the content. But like if it never got posted, that time that I spent in that relationship was well worth it. And so that's the fastest way to get clients, fastest way to get paid. But it doesn't like people aren't going to watch a lot of those because they aren't the best types of content. Sometimes, I mean, if you interview high level people that can work that way, but um, you know, really the goal is your ideal client is being interviewed or interacted with. Let's just talk about video in general and its importance yep. in business today. Um, yeah. Cause obviously that's what you do. That's your business. And, and that's what you are. Uh, so you and I are of the same you know, we're of the same opinion here, but talk about the importance of video and, and how big of an impact it really can have on a business. Yeah. Yeah. One of the stats that I like to cite often was it's a Google study, but they found it takes seven hours of interaction and you know between seven and 11 touch points for someone to know I can trust you. If you have to go and do that individually, personally on a sales call in a meeting, like that's going to take a long time. If you want to be able to scale that, create a you know, if you're creating seven one hour videos and people are watching those, it's phenomenal. I had a client that invited me to speak at their event and, you know, he asked in the room, he's like, how many of you have it watched at least 10 hours of my video? And like, this is a, it, it's five grand to take at minimum. There's much higher levels, but like at least five grand, every single person raised their hand. He's like, how many of you watched at least 20 hours of my content? Every hand was still up. People spent hours and hours and hours watching his content before attending the event. And he didn't talk to 98% of them ever personally, or even, you know, maybe some of his team had reached out and depending on what level they were at, but most of the people bought tickets, expensive tickets to this conference without ever interacting with them personally, because they're able to scale that one-on-one -on -one time through the content. And so you're able to get people to know, like, and trust you, understand what you do, understand how big of an expert you are in your space. like so much that you can do that just scales and it, you're getting clients while you sleep you're making money while you sleep your business is growing while you sleep like it's there's just so much you can do and it doesn't have to take a lot of time you can spend hour three hours a week somewhere in that range and still create a lot of amazing content and be able to grow really really well and I think that's one of the, what you just talked about you know everybody loves to talk about doing something in their sleep but yeah. content is that because mm -hmm. once you put it out there, as long as you don't delete it, 
it's evergreen. You know, uh, an ad has a certain period of time. You're going to run this ad from this time to this time, and then maybe you're going to take a break. Yeah. So once that ad's not running, nobody's seeing it. But with content, it's out there. And I'm sure you've experienced this too. You have a video you might have done six months ago or even a year ago, and mm -hmm. it's still getting you interactions, which means it's still being pushed out to other people. And then on top of that, it's still getting you leads. And that's the best part about content is, yeah. is it's evergreen. And, um, you know, there's, it's almost, it's almost un or impossible to quantify how much a single piece of content can be worth in your lifetime. You know, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you get so many skills from creating content too. Like that event that I spoke at, there were, over 200 people. I, I, I mean, I've spoken before, but never for business purpose live. I've done a lot of virtual, done a lot of videos, done a lot of that. And I had so many people come up to me like, that was phenomenal. I have questions. Can I work with you? And I'd never done that in person, but all of the skills that I've gotten from virtual presentation, well, this isn't presentation, but podcasts, presentations, videos, I've done thousands at this point. And I've been able to practice all those skills without the hassle of trying to go speak places. Like people know me, like, before this interaction, before you reached out, I, I didn't know who you were, but you knew who I was and you had learned and grown and done a lot of things. And every time you create a, create a piece of content, you have that potential to have someone who knows, likes and trusts you and maybe eventually wants to work with you because of that. And if not, they're able to pass, like if you have a great video out and they see a problem with one of their clients, friends, family, they can say, hey, watch this video. And it just spreads. As long as you're giving that amazing value out, people are being helped by it and they want to share it. And, you know, there seems to be this large increase right now of people creating content. But let's be honest, people are going to get fatigued when it doesn't translate to immediate revenue. And mm. then you're going to have like this vacuum of all these people who were creating content and and are no longer creating content. Talk about the you know talk about the mindset that it takes to create content because like i said it's it's not an a to b process it's it's one of yeah. those things that you you really do have to think long term don't you yeah yeah and you really do and it's an art and a science and so if you can have the mindset that i'm going to do this for the next 5 years you're you're going to win because sorry you're going to make 50 to 100 videos that suck everybody does like i'm not saying this because people listening are not good at this. I'm saying this because this is a learning curve. My first 50 to 100 videos sucked and still like I go watch them like, oh man, I should just delete these, but they still get views. Like it, it, leave it up there. It's part of the journey. Um, but also again, it, it goes back to that client that I mentioned 10 years of creating content, you know, hundreds and hundreds of videos, but they didn't have the right mindset of like, this is my goal with this. And so um, something that Evan says all too often to me is like, if you were getting paid more for this, you'd be passionate about it. It's like, yeah, you get paid enough for this. If you creating videos is your number one revenue generating source, you're going to be really passionate about making sure that video goes out every single week, day, hour, whatever, however often you're posting what platforms like if that is your number and it has the potential to be your number one source of revenue, like it's going to change everything. But again, it comes down to, are you creating the type of content that's actually serving your goals? All too often people are like, well, this is, this should get me clients but it's, it's not the right type of content. It's not proven to actually get them the clients. And like, it's, it's fine. I'll just invest for a year or two on the thought leadership type content. It, it's going to get me business. That enthusiasm lasts for six to eight weeks and then it dies. And it's like, nope, this isn't working. It's like, well, you, you committed to a year or two, but we're giving up too early because we don't see the quick wins. We don't see the results. And so anytime I work with a client, it's like, we're going to focus on getting the quick wins as fast as possible, generating as much revenue as fast as possible, because you're going to see, Hey, this is, this is huge. This could change my entire business if I do it right. What do you believe podcasts can do for a business? Because there's almost like this melding now, you know, more and more people are doing video podcasts because they understand, mm -hmm. okay, I can cut this up into smaller clips for short form video content, but talk about how you feel about podcasts and their impact. Yeah. Yeah. So podcasting, and this isn't a hard requirement, but generally speaking, I look for someone who has a podcast when I'm looking for a client, because if you're not on YouTube with your podcast 
and you have a top 100 podcast is really easy. Like you, you have to have so much grit to be able to create that much content on a platform that has zero discoverability and to do that well. And so if we add video, this is going to go really fast and do really, really well. Or people already have hundreds of thousands of followers on YouTube and you know, we can, we can work with that and, and use the podcast, but the podcast is that secret weapon. Those, the three shows that I mentioned, a podcast can fit every single category, which is beautiful. And if people ask me all the time, what's the difference between a podcast and a YouTube podcast and a YouTube show in my mind, it's, it's a YouTube based show We're we're thinking YouTube first, we're thinking video first, but it can be listened to potentially without having to see the video. And it still makes sense. Um, you know, if you're watching a product review video on YouTube, that's not going to make sense as a podcast. Like you've got to be able to see the thing, but if someone's talking, maybe if you have a diagram or something you're showing on your screen, you can describe it. Just make sure you're thinking, okay, people may only be listening to this because often on YouTube as well, you know, so many people are paying for premium or we just use a different tab and you're listening to the podcast on YouTube without watching it. YouTube is the number one platform for podcasts, even before they came out with the podcast section, which still needs a lot of work but they've demolished and, and taken over so much of the market share because of this discoverability. And so if you have a podcast, if you have a show, you can get clients and good business relationships. You can show the process that can be part of your podcast where it's, Hey, it's a Q and a show once a week. It's a, you know, you know, helping a person like dive into their business, breaking things down show. And then you have, you know, that thought leadership where it's just you talking for 30 to 60 minutes. It's all under the same channel, all under the same podcast show, but it's just, three different show types. Um, so podcasting combined with YouTube is gold for businesses, in my opinion. And when you when you think about podcasts, um, I think the first thing people think is, oh my God, everyone's got podcast fatigue. There are so many podcasts out there. Yeah. But again, it's the tenacity and mm -hmm. you're going to you're going to last in that space and there's still room isn't there i mean as many podcasts as many probably literally maybe millions of podcasts that have been started there's still room in the space for them yeah yeah and most podcasts it's like something crazy last time i looked at the stat i think it was like 86% never make it past episode 3 of a podcast so you don't have to do a whole lot to be in the top percentage you just got to keep showing up but if you're solving a big problem for people, if someone wants to get healthier, if they want to make more money, if they need you know, relationship advice, if you are the person that can connect with them, because that's important in someone that's watching you, and you're solving a mass $10,000 problem for them, a huge life challenge, maybe they've been overweight for a really long time, maybe all of their relationships fall apart. These are huge issues they're thinking about day and night. They're more than willing to listen to hours and hours of content for you to help them solve those problems because otherwise they're going to be trying to solve them on their own. And I mean, I don't know what population we're at in the world, like 7.8 billion. Like there, there's a niche. There is a group, a tribe, a you know, a thousand raving fans who are going to connect with you. I have my first channel I ever started. It's called Muscular Style. I've actually gone back to creating content on there because that's kind of the passion project. Um, but I had even at like 1500 subscribers, I had videos with almost 100,000 views, which I thought was really, really odd because usually if you have more views than subscribers, that video did well. So if it had like 1600 views, that's a good video. But I have view, like 95,000 views on a t-shirt video. I'm like, this is how? Muscular guys have a hard time finding clothes. They like the gym. They like diet nutrition. Like that is a small subset and I have a really passionate following there and it pushes it out because I have so many loyal people there. So even with a small audience, it gets lots of views. And I have so many people like I, I stopped creating content on there for a while to do the, we are video makers content. And they're like, where'd you go? Why aren't you creating content? Where, like, I need more of this. I'm like, this is just insane. And so there are some people that are going to latch onto you and really want that content from you specifically. They can go find it from bigger names, but they really want it from you for whatever their personal reason is for that. And you're going to be able to fill that for them. And I think this is really interesting. I looked at both your, we are video makers, TikTok. And then yeah. I looked at your personal TikTok and obviously the, the, a, the interaction and B, the, you know, the viewership, if you will, of your personal one is, is much superior. Talk about the importance of personal brand and face to what you're doing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, as people, we, we connect better with people than we do brands. Like we, we think, oh, it's a corporation. Oh, it's a big business. My, my muscular style account, which is that one, like 
it is not a big business. It's a hobby channel, but it feels like a business because you see a logo because you don't, you know, you don't see the personal side as much. You don't throw up these subconscious barriers. If you just see a person, if you just see like, Oh, this is me sharing my advice, my tips, things that I've tried, learned and failed at or succeeded at. Like we don't throw up those barriers. It's the same when people ask me, they're like, what camera should I buy? What equipment should I buy? Like, how do I make all this? I'm like, what really matters is the quality of the information that you're sharing. Are you sharing your secret sauce? Are you solving problems? There is subconscious barriers that go up though. We've got one minute to get those down. Do you look decent? Do you sound decent as far as audio and video quality? You can use your smartphone. You don't need a camera unless you're creating content on how to make cinematic looking content. Then you need to like, that's when we expect high quality. But other than that, I'm going to move it. Like, are you professional enough to figure out how to use your phone? Are you professional enough that you've spent $50 on a microphone? Check, check. Okay, cool. Now, are you competent enough to answer my questions and solve my problems? If you are, I'm going to listen. If you aren't, I'm not going to listen. But if your audio is just horrendous, so I can't even listen to it, or your video is so just grainy that I can't see it, I'm going to be like, uh, they, they can't even figure this out. There's no way they can answer my questions. It doesn't take a lot to check those off and pull down those subconscious barriers, though. So it doesn't matter as much, but we need that personal connection. You can share all of the systems, all the processes, all of the information someone needs to change their life, their business, whatever it is. But if there's not that personal connection to why they should apply that, they're not going to do it. And having a business account can sometimes you know, raise some barriers you have to overcome. And I know one of the things that you talked about early in your account was actually your introverted nature. And yet here you are, making video, putting your face on video. How did you overcome those challenges? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I actually have um, autism spectrum disorder. And so typically when you see someone with that, it's like social, like so socially closed off that it, it's debilitating for a lot of people. For me, I, I haven't had that as much. I do have that. Like if we're in a small, small group, a couple of people, I'm fine. If we're in a really large group, like if I'm speaking to a large group of people, again, I'm fine. I don't, I don't know why that is, but there's like this small medium range where it's like, there's too many people to interact with, but I feel the expectation that I just kind of like, I freak out creating videos. I'm talking to a camera. I, I know there's people listening on the other side. I'm picturing those people, but I know it's a camera. I know if I really mess up and I'm really terrible, I can take it out in editing. Like if you're afraid of that, I mean, we're live right now. So this is a little different, which, you know, I, I went live on Amazon live, which most people don't even know what Amazon live is, but I went live 105 times in two and a half months and just practiced a lot. And so got really decent at live streaming, overcame that fear and just you see the fear and you, you go attack it. Like it, if you're afraid to talk to a camera, then you, you need to practice, practice with the camera first. It, one person's watching, maybe nobody's watching. That's okay. Like you're going to be able to get some practice in while nobody's watching. <laughs> so when you are good, that's when people are actually watching. Um, but it's public speaking is a huge fear for people. It's not something I've had. And so I can't have the empathy that I wish I could for that. Um, but I know that if you're just thinking, I just want to help one person with this content, I'm just talking to the camera and that one person. And if I can even make a little dent in how good their life is, it's going to be worth it. Maybe you get hundreds of thousands of views. Maybe that one person finds your video. It doesn't matter because you're putting that goodwill out into the universe. You're doing everything that you can to help. And it's going to come back to you in some form or another. So you talked about it. It was on my list of things to talk to you about. Talk about Amazon Live and how that can help businesses yeah. these days. Yeah. So Amazon Live is an interesting animal. Um, I tested it out, had someone show it to me and they're like, hey, you should try this. I'm like, okay, cool. We'll try it. Um, there's a lot of different ways it is. We think TikTok is kind of the wild west. Amazon live really is the, the wild west. You see everything from like QVC style selling and pitching of products to people live, sh like gaming while they're doing products to podcasts that hardly ever talk about products. Like, there's just so many ways to do this, but what happens is your live stream shows up on a product page. People have the ability to ask you questions about it. I, my experience, not a whole lot of people did. Um, but if anyone sees your video on there and they buy any products after watching even just a little bit of your video, you get commission for that. And so if you are a business that sells products, uses products frequently, even if you just want to practice live streaming, that's it. Like I made, I don't know, $4,000 from the live streaming there. And I didn't have to do a whole lot to get to that point. Like it's... Is it a small amount of income for the amount of hours I put in? Yeah, but I was already creating the content anyway. I was already doing it. As long as you're not allowing it to affect how you're creating content, 
it's just a potential for more money that way. And I grew 600 subscribers in two and a half months. Like it's Amazon wants to show that content to people because like it helps them to sell products. And so I've thought about at I have a couple of hobby channels. Another one's Colorado Barbecue Boys. We just review barbecue stuff and cook food. But I thought about setting up a live stream where we're cooking and using some things that way. That might be fun. Um, there are some unique ways. I've seen people run mid six figure businesses just on Amazon. They were early on to the platform and they've stuck with it consistently. Um, so it can make a huge difference. It's just another tool in the tool belt though. YouTube is king as far as discoverability goes, but if you're live streaming something, you can go to both platforms. You can go to mo like, it's just an add on. And so I think it's an interesting one. If you don't have products to sell or products on Amazon, it may not be the best for you or products you use, I guess. Um, but it definitely, I see Amazon doing something really, really cool with it. I just don't think it's quite here. I think it's going to be another year or two before it really gets to the point where people are like, oh, let's, let's hop on here. Do you see live as a medium becoming more of the norm for businesses to, to allow people to, to connect with them? Or do you still see it more of the pre-recorded content? Yeah. So I have mixed feelings on this. I think partly because of how YouTube handles live. I, I'm so disappointed in how they handle live because it, if you're okay with the video dying after a week, go live on YouTube. It doesn't do really, really well. And so if you have an announcement or you're, you know, you're launching, so maybe you have a really big video and you want to do an hour live before that and answer questions and get people hyped for it. Sure. That's great. Maybe you're launching a book. You have a new product out, something like that. That's great. It's not great any other way on YouTube because it just dies too fast. I would take that recorded video. So like this podcast, something like that, I would take that and post it as a video, not go live. Um, but as far as live selling, live consulting, li like I think there's a huge space for it. People are craving that personal interaction and you know they'll watch the content for the information to get to know, like, and trust you, but then they want to pay for access. Then they want to have that personal touch. And so people will buy your programs, buy your coaching because they want the access, not because you're not putting out the information, but because they want to be able to apply it to themselves. And that live aspect allows you to do a lot of that. And so I do see that being a huge thing. I, Amazon's doubling down on it. Walmart is doubling down on it. There's a lot of companies oh, wow. in the background are really getting into the space and you're going to see it go from nothing to exploding. Um, but it depends on your business. It depends on a lot of different things. Um, overall, YouTube is king very specifically for each niche, one of these other platforms where live is included might be a, an amazing secondary or even primary, depending on what your business is. Do you see um, short form content continuing to, to grow the way that it has, especially over the last 12 to 18 months? Yeah. Again, mixed feelings on short content. And I think this is partly because I work in the education space where it's entrepreneurs, business problems, it's health, it's a lot of those things. If I have a $10,000 problem, you're not going to sell me on a solution in 50 seconds. <laughs> it's going to take a lot longer than that. And rightly so. Like if, if you tell me 50 seconds worth of information, that's not enough to solve my $10,000 problem. And so getting, you know, eyes on that type of content, absolutely. It's great. It's it. On YouTube, there's mixed data. We're, we're testing a lot with that and there's not anything conclusive of like, this is helping a ton. It does help, but it, it, it's just an adjunct to the strategy. But there are certain types of content where short form really is phenomenal. Like if you're looking for, uh, TikTok does this phenomenally well. So like, um, you know, I live close to Denver, best restaurants in Denver. And I can see a 30 second clip of the food, of the ambiance, of all that. It's like, oh, I've got to try that place out. And you hear of these creators reviewing restaurants and these restaurants get flooded. Like so many you know, people coming in, they can't handle it. That's one way that I see short form really, really dominating. For education space, for that type of thing, getting eyes on it, teaching really, really quick concepts, I, feel, I still think works well. Um, but it's not going to be king as far as like high ticket clients, things like that. Um, so I do see it growing. I just see it in different market sectors, depending on what services you offer. And, you know, it is, it's more top of funnel. Like you said, you're not mm -hmm. going to make, um, you know, because Gary Vee talks about that famous story about somebody seeing a cement company video yeah. on TikTok and it led to a $100,000 contract. Well, of course, it probably didn't lead to, hey, I saw 30 seconds about your company and now I'm going to spend a hundred grand yeah. with you. But it is a great, you know, it's a great top of funnel for people who are familiar with the marketing term. Yeah.
And I had two $15,000 contracts come from TikTok videos. I really did. But it started with a TikTok video, which led to a relationship, which led to more interaction. Like it, it was that initial contact point. It didn't even do anything to sell anything at all, but it connected me with the right people. What do you attribute or how has the, how has your, your business evolved that you are, you are running in the spaces with the Evan Carmichael's and the Chris Doe's and those people of the world. How did that evolution take place? That was, I, again, accidentally on purpose is my answer. It was the tenacity that I have. Like I, I, I'm okay asking any question. My philosophy is if you don't ask the answers automatically, no, if you do ask potentially it's a yes. And so um, like Christo, I had been in his group for a while, done a lot of free trainings. I asked if I could do a free training, said yes. Um, it was a small, like they have different levels of training. So I was like, hey, that one went well. Can I do a bigger one? Yeah, absolutely. So I did multiple of those. And then when I asked Chris, he was like, yeah, absolutely. I'll come on. I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Sweet. Evan Carmichael, again, same. I, I had a few questions that were very specific to clients, um, actually with podcasts on YouTube, and I couldn't find answers. Um, I, I'm just at a high enough level on YouTube where there's very, very few people that give that kind of information, especially without paying. Maybe if I was getting one-on-one -on -one consulting, there were more people, but it just, I couldn't find the answers anywhere. And I heard Evan give a half answer to one of my questions on a video. It's like, I've got to have this guy on. So I did a video because I, because of the autism spectrum disorder, when I'm interested in something, I just go 180% in. Like I learn so fast because it's all my brain can think about. And it's annoying to like, it impacts some things, but it also allows me to get really, really good at the things that I'm interested in. Um, and so I made a video on top five tips from him. I, I shared like the thumbnail in my uh, Instagram story and just said videos live. I tagged him. And then after that, I sent him a message like, Hey, I would love to have you on the podcast. I, I you're probably never going to see this and that's okay. But if you ever have time, I would love to chat. He sent me a video message like a couple hours later, which just happenstance. Cause there's a lot of big people that reach out to him that never hear back. I just, all the things lined up and he's like, yeah, let's do it. Um, I was like, okay, cool. And we talked through my business and you know, he gave me the compliment on a live stream the other day. He's like, you were one of my most prepared, um, you know, podcast interviewers, uh, because you, I watched 40 hours of his content before I <laughs> interviewed him. Um, and he's like, I, I love your business. I invest in people like you. And, you know, I just so happens that right now I'm actually looking to invest in a new business. So let's, let's do it. And his name has gotten me into a lot of places. Like it, when I first started on YouTube, um, the guy that I mentioned earlier where he was quitting his job, he had 140,000. Well, he has 140,000 on YouTube and I would drop his name to brands to get them to send me stuff. Cause I was, you know, collaborating with him. And so that made sense. And then get bigger friend circles and you just kind of work up and the entire time it's not like, oh, how do I get a hold of this person so I can I can leverage their name and I, I, I just genuinely love what they're doing and I want to help and give value and I lead with value. I lead with goodwill, even if it never comes back. I know it's gonna come back somehow. I was actually on a call with someone and kind of flip places where he was super successful and I was struggling and now it's the other way around. And um on the call is like give your best stuff away. Help as many people as you possibly can and you'll win. I was like, I guarantee you. You're not paying me for this call. This could be an easily a thousand dollar call. I will get more value than that in the next seven days. What I didn't know is I had a client message me during that call that I've been trying to get back onto my service for multiple thousands of dollars and said, Hey, we're ready. <laughs> and so it was, I, I couldn't have predicted that, but because I led with value, because I'm trying to help people and genuinely just trying to help people see that. And I'm okay reaching out to bigger names to offer them help. That's how I've gotten my clients is. I direct message them. I say, Hey, I have three big ideas. I know will help your YouTube channel. And I just want to send you a quick free video. And so many people with, and they don't know me, but they have hundreds of thousands of subscribers on YouTube. They're like, yeah, well, I would love it. Send me the video and they end up becoming clients because I'm leading with that value first. And you said the key ask, I've yeah. talked to so many people and it just started with, I watched their content and I said, Hey, would you become, you know, would you come on to my podcast? That's how I got socialty pro Austin Armstrong. I mean, the guy's got 600,000 followers on TikTok and half a million on YouTube. And I'm like, but he said, yes, because I asked same thing with, um, you know, a storytelling coach who's got a book out same thing. And it's amazing because that's what I love so much about this space and about the education space is people will say yes generally because they remember where they were when they didn't really have anybody to rely on. And there's there's such a giving and a an unselfishness in this space. And 
that's why I love, you know, doing a podcast like this is because, you know, I get to talk with heroes and mentors and things like that. So, but the overarching thing is, you'll, like you said, you'll never know unless you ask. And that's what most people just won't do. They won't ask the question. And, you know, it would be amazing um, to end this little diatribe, but it would be amazing if they would just ask the doors that it would open for them. And I'm sure you've discovered that as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's flattering to be asked to come on a show, regardless of people like, well, I don't have that many subscribers. It's like, okay, but you are going to another human being who has spent years practicing the thing that they are good at and want to talk about and giving them an opportunity to have some sort of audience they never would have reached and share their message with the world. Like it's, it's flattering. And again, not everyone, like if they're high enough level, maybe they're like, Hey, sorry, I need at least a million views on this video. It's like, okay, cool. You're a little too high up there. That's, that's fine. Most people are just gonna be flattered and be like, Hey, like if I have time, yes, I, this is what I live my life to do. I live to share my message and you just made it easy and I don't have to go find this opportunity. It came to me. So yes, please. Um, and just go in with it, like, believe that they want to help you believe that they want to share their message and then ask. And if you go with that mindset more often than not, in my experience, they, they say yes. Yeah. And it's the whole thing. You're right. You have to lead with value. It can't be about what you want. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why most of, um, the people that I see in business who are creating content, it's all about them, 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 rather than what we all know is everybody's favorite radio station is what's in it for me. <laughs> and they don't understand that. And yeah. there's like this, um, you know, cause I was just so curious about your evolution, you know, cause I, like I said, I started watching you in the beginning and I was just curious about that evolution. And so, while that's serving me, obviously it gives you a chance to talk about what you're able to do for businesses. Now, Zach, um, this, as we start to wrap up here, what are the type of businesses that you work with? So if we have mm -hmm. some people that have those type of businesses and they want to reach out for your services, what are the, the types of businesses that you work with primarily? Yeah. So, yeah. So primarily like people that are coaches in the education space, providing consulting services, um, things like that, because on YouTube, the fastest growing segment of videos is one to three hours. And we have thought leadership frameworks. We know that work templates for thumbnails. We know that work. like, that's our space. We, you know, work with the best in the world in that space. And so like, if you want to do product reviews, like I've have, you know, experience in that, but that's not what we do best. And so I wouldn't be okay charging what I charge to someone who isn't in my area that we really, really focus on. So um, yeah, consultants or education space is really where we're at. And there are a couple of people that I'm helping that are just getting going on YouTube, but almost always they have like half a million audience somewhere else, or they have a top 50 or 100 podcasts in the world, or like we really are working with world-class. And so my main thing with coming on podcasts like this is just to give, just to help and you know, hopefully someone's able to grow their business and, and do a biz dev channel or a show and get another client, make an extra 10 grand this month. Like that, that's what fuels me for this. Like my client list is, I, I've got like four slots open, maybe I'm very selective about those. And so if no one ever comes from this, that's fine, but I, I just want to help. And I want to make sure that if you're in that space, you're creating the right shows more than happy to have people reach out to me. Maybe I'll keep making some content on this. And um, I, I've really given up on most platforms except YouTube, just because my my client list is full. My, my business is thriving. I, I don't I don't need to do it. And I, I found that while I am super passionate, what I'm passionate about in this space is coming in and seeing the impact that I have on people's businesses and their channels. And I don't get to do that with my content as much. And so um, totally off topic, but like health and nutrition and regenerative, you know, meat and, and things like that, that really fuels me. I have a degree in nutrition and pathophysiology. So I love that stuff. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out if people are in that space where they have decent audience in the education space. I would love to chat, even if it's a you know free one hour call that we do, whether we work together or not, but I do that all the time to help. And this is going to be like the, the 30 second answer of this. And then I'll tell people how they can find you, but zeroing in on one platform as opposed to repurposing on all yeah. platforms, where do you fall on that? In my experience, if you focus on one platform first and you master it, you can repurpose. It's going to be 60 to 80% as effective as contextualizing per platform. But if you dominate YouTube, which is where I would recommend you start, you can cut short form from a long 
podcast. You need a really highly skilled person to do that well. So maybe just creating shorts that are very targeted and very succinct is better. But if you have those reels that are shorts on YouTube, you can post it on Instagram. You can post it on TikTok. You can post it everywhere else. In my experience, the money is made AdSense wise as well as brand deal and client wise on YouTube. It, the discoverability isn't matched by anything else, at least right now. Maybe in five years, a different platform comes along and demolishes YouTube. I don't see that happening. But if it did, I, I'm not in love with YouTube. I'm in love with YouTube because of all the things that it does. It's king at what it does um, for the education space, for the long form content. And so if that changes, we'll change our business model to match. But it's been going for a good long time. And I just, I don't see businesses thriving on other platforms like they do on YouTube unless they're products. And so Instagram maybe is a little bit better, but it just, YouTube is the place. So if, again, if Instagram is your holy grail and that's really working, double down, triple down, quadruple down on that. And if you have the bandwidth, post other places. I don't think you need to, honestly, as long as your business is growing and thriving, I don't think you need to, but if it's little effort and it's not going to hurt anything, go ahead and repurpose, post other places. Where can people find you? Yeah. Um, so Zach Mitchum on LinkedIn. Um, I am on YouTube as well, that muscular style and Zach Mitchum consistently content. I'm all over the place. And so I think that's a little hard, but LinkedIn, um, my Zach Mitchum LinkedIn, that's always going to be there. Um, you'll always be able to reach me there. And my Zach Mitchum Instagram is also something I'm consistently on. Awesome. Well, I know you're a busy guy. You are, you're a guest on podcasts. You have your own podcast. You're being invited to speak at people's conferences. So I really do appreciate the time. And thanks for joining us today, Zach. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on.